Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon and welcome to this Sheffield documentary session. Access remains at the heart of the whole business of documentary filmmaking. It reveals worlds that are often hidden from our everyday lives and it reflects back to us how we live and how others live. And to discuss the art of access, I'm delighted to be joined by two of the finest filmmakers in the business. Paul Heyman is the creative director of Wild Pictures and the former head of BBC Documentaries. At Wild, Paul has overseen many acclaimed and highly rating, uh, rated programs, including Her Majesty's Prison Aylesbury, Strange Ways, and In the Line of Fire, as against In Line of Fire, which was by, with my friend, Mr. Morgan Freeman. Um, he, he, he won uh, Grayson for his seminal film, 14 Days in May, about an innocent man condemned to death, and he won a BAFTA for the series, The Duty Men. Like Paul, uh, here, uh, Michael Waldman's films have been also known for the major impact they've had on the whole business of television. The house, portraying the life inside the Royal Opera House, was something of a big television event and a television game changer, as was Opportunity. Michael's awards include BAFTA, International Emmys, and RTS. And uh, his work is well known to all people who watch t television in this country. His most recent film, Our Queen, was broadcast on ITV1 earlier this year and featured access which, uh, to the monarch which we all envy. I'd just like to tell you about how this, we plan to run this session. We'll go on for about 40 minutes uh, uh, putting questions to both gentlemen. Um, we have clips of their films to illustrate the work they've done and we would very much like to give you a chance to put your questions to these two eminent filmmakers. So may I ask you please to welcome my two guests, Paul and Michael. <laughs> Gentlemen, I wonder whether I could begin with a very basic question about, about what you do. And I wonder whether you could give us some idea of this whole business of, of access. Has it got more difficult? Is it getting more difficult? Has securing access getting harder? Paul? Um, I, I don't think getting access has ever been, has ever been, has ever been easy. And I, I think today with much, many more channels and, um, and outlets for, for programs and the fact that access rates, so there's a lot more people uh, on your patch trying to, trying to secure it. Um, I think the, games, the game has changed that I've noticed, particularly in the last year, um, the major uh, public relations companies in Britain, Bell Pottinger, uh, Freud's, et cetera, represent now some of the, some of the large British brand names which uh, British broadcasters want you to get access. And I think that's, that's created a problem. And is that a good, I mean, are they, is that a good thing? Are they a bar? Um, they, it, it can be remarkably successful and you can get access to, to previously closed places where no one's been before, but also they, they, uh, they attach strings. Yeah, they can be a bit of a yeah. nuisance. Yeah. Michael. <coughs> yes, uh, uh, it, it has undoubtedly got more difficult as there's a greater sophistication and awareness of the PR problems that can be caused. And um, I'm very aware that uh, after the transmission of the house, various of my colleagues told me, which is many years ago for those of you uh, of a uh, not dinosauric age, um, it was transmitted in 96 and uh, it was controversial to my benefit, but possibly not to the opera houses. And uh, as a consequence of that and no doubt other things, uh, there's a real sense then and increasingly that um, Telly, if you let it in, can do harm. Uh, but the converse of that, of course, is that it can also do good, and not just in a sort of straight PR terms. In other words, if some, uh, if a, if a place has a perceived, a self-perceived problem or challenge, then uh, there's still a sense that the solution might be uh, an observational documentary. Yeah, I wonder whether we could try and illustrate the point. Um, 
Paul, by uh, your showing us and talking to a bit of one of your, your films, um, Her Majesty's Prison, Aylesbury, to, to make the, the, the point. Could you introduce us to that and, and, yeah, and, and um, speak to the, the question? We've had, uh, my company's had remarkable success w w since in the last, with four major series for ITV1 in the last five years uh, with Br Inside British Prisons. The first one was Holloway and the audience uh, um, has been very loyal and it's been built up until we, we got into we got into Ellsbury. But how did um, you get access to, to that? How difficult was that? It was it, Ellsbury wasn't difficult. Uh, the first one was very difficult. Holloway. Yeah. It took a year to get in, and um, I, I, I think the, the the amusing thing about it once we got the access, uh, I offered it to every um, British broadcaster, the, the ITV, BBC. Channel 4, and they all turned it down. I, I hasten to add, not the current head of documentaries at ITV or the BBC. And so I did something, I, I always never take no, so I did something I've only done twice before. I called Michael Grade, who was running ITV at the time, and saying, do you realize we've got this access? It will actually probably get four million. It did, and uh, it was commissioned within a week. So, um, well, let's, um, let's now take a look at that. Um, uh, give us a, a clip of Her Majesty's Prison, Aylesbury. Here it comes. smack you up with a hammer in your head or something or burn your toes with a basically a bunsen burner then after that if you see our face then we have to kill you innit? the morals are all mixed up here you say no you'll turn around and say i want to smash your face in what are you gonna do what are you gonna do it's completely unpredictable. You could be standing there talking to prisoner and someone's had a porky around their head. What are you gonna do? Welcome to hell. What are you gonna do? I'm constantly amazed at what nice people we meet in prisons like, like, like this. Michael, what about your film, Our, Our Queen? Slightly, slightly different to the one we just seen, but, but the access to, to that. I mean, one is, is told that getting access to that side of British life, monarchic side, is extremely difficult. Uh, it is, and um, it's always limited. Uh, Her Majesty's prison, uh, Her Majesty's courts, Her Majesty's almost everything, and so sh the token quality of what she is means that uh, in terms of what we were discussing, you know, the palace is not averse to the possibility of improving the brand. Their, their, their sophistication means that they don't do what, you know, a 19th century um, press secretary would do, which is say, never can it happen. There was a famous, the opening of that door slightly was for the first time and unprecedented at the time and not uh, superseded was a film in 1969 called The Royal Family, which was the first time ever they did that. And since then, there have been two or three sort of major moments where I, I presume, because I wasn't involved in the, my predecessor's uh, works, where a degree of access has been given. In our case, and the difficulty, you know, if the question is, has it got harder? In the case of The Queen, undoubtedly much harder for two, three obvious reasons. One, she's 86. <coughs> So you can get all sorts of things, but the thing that we want, which is her, for all obvious reasons, it, her age does make a difference from their mm. point of view. Two, she's done it before, two or three times. I mean, she's done, you know, she's been filmed endlessly every day, but in terms of actually getting a bit beyond the press pen, it has happened before. And more catastrophically than anything else, uh, the brand is doing extremely well. So what I was referring to earlier about a, an organization feeling they have a problem and possibly a, a, an access dock would solve So she solve doesn't it. need you? She definitely doesn't need us. Uh, didn't, doesn't, won't. And um, so uh, it was complicated. And we can perhaps discuss later how there's getting in a little bit and then getting further. And getting in a little bit is, with the Queen, very difficult. And uh, the initial access for this project was extremely limited. Well, let's, let's, let's take but a look. But it got a bit better, yes. as you'll see. Let's take a look at this clip. Our Queen. The Prime Minister's red box follows him everywhere. 
as the Queen's follows her. The main business of the weekend will be the Prime Minister's audience the next day. It takes place in the Queen's private sitting room. The Queen checks with her press secretary that there is enough light for the camera. Is that light all right? Or it gets dark suddenly? The weather, we've been so fortunate with the weather today and yesterday, it's been lovely. But the sun goes down, isn't it? It goes behind the hill and that's it. Mm, really? <laughs> so, have you been round quite a lot of the places? I went to um, La Shields, I think. Oh, right up the lock. Yeah, oh, yes, right, yes, ma'am. Yes. Yeah. Queen Victoria's house. Yes. She used to make the Prime Minister come up and see her there. <laughs> the Prime Minister, Your Majesty. Good evening. Good evening, Your Majesty. Well, I, st I stopped the clip there. It, luckily, it went on and we got some wonderful stuff. Um, but it's, uh, that was not, that sort of access was not agreed at the beginning. So that was, I mean, it was really great. Just, just looking at that, one saw scenes that you don't, you, we read constantly about, but you don't actually see things there. And in this digital age, uh, the fact that we're shooting on HD means that the screen grabs are fantastic quality. Uh, actually, I'm, I'm glad to say, surprised uh, ITV picture publicity chief who said to me, oh my, when it came to transmission, don't tell me you've only got screen grabs, they'll be crap, and it always infuriates me, why didn't you have a photographer? And I, you know, the answer to the second question, why didn't we have a photographer, is uh, in that room is, I was told I couldn't be there, there could only be the cameraman and the sound recordist, and of course this is not a, a, a self-shooting DV show on the whole, especially with that sort of access. So. Um, I, who am a bit of a technophobe, became the sound recordist for that. that but and you, you, got her involved, you got her involved in the lighting, so that was great. Well, indeed, she showed her some professionalism, and indeed, I mean, it's, it's interesting that she was asking, actually, we said the press secretary, she was actually asking the cameraman and myself about the light, but we used the, we, the commentary, introduced this voice off, which was the press secretary's. But she, no, she, the, 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 uh, the, the, the point about the HD thing is just a matter of, I'm jumping here, but to the, uh, tr publicity, the, uh, those little shots that we'd taken, of course, before I'd said to the press secretary, we need to get in to see how the light is in the room, which was a complete lie, but I told the cameraman to bring his camera and we got quick shots of the cushion saying, uh, you know, good to be queen and various other knickknacks which were lying around, which in Buckingham Palace they were. And those pictures almost went viral in terms of the press coverage yeah, because it showed a little old lady's rather grand sitting room. Well, it, it takes us quite logically on to the, the point which I'd like to raise with you, Paul, as, 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 as a beginning to the, the other question I'd like to ask is when we are very, very conscious of how difficult access to something like both your films could be, do you think hard-won access, when you, we know that what you've done is extremely difficult, does that almost kind of automatically help you to make a better film? I think, think probably f far from it. You, once you've got the access, it's very difficult. Um, it's the beginning, isn't it? It's very difficult to, it's, it's quite easy to, to, to screw it up. And, and it, it happens, you, you can see it on, on, there are many examples of it. it it's, the, the key, once you've got that access, is casting is everything. And it's picking people who are not just good directors, but more importantly, picking people who are, self-effacing, who have an ability to get on with, whether it, like in Michael's case it's the, the Queen or whether it's some of our worst criminals at, at Strange Ways Prison, the ability to be their friend. And you have, to, you have to create that access, you have to massage it, you have to nurture it, you have to stroke it. And I think it's picking, cast, in my answer to that, it's casting is everything, it's picking the people <coughs> that are going, and having a mixed team also, a team which has got different sorts of personalities. Uh, the prison series, I wouldn't, do, I wouldn't do any of the prison series unless there was a really good female PD on it. Because a female PD? Because why, why, why female? In my, because I've been in my career from being a young researcher to now. I, I've worked on many prison films and most prisoners, female ones as well, talk uh, a significant proportion more, like, more openly to a woman than they do to a man. Is that, is that your experience? Uh, in terms of women versus men on the production team, uh, no, there are definitely pla times and places where it makes sense to have both. I mean, you know, given it's me, uh, an AP or researcher, I would, I would consciously be aware of gender. But who but was the person you think who convinced 
the palace, for example, in your film, was there, was, was there one person who convinced them that they should do that? Because there were, there were shooting scenes which, as I say, we read about a lot, prime minister's audiences every week or whatever, privy councillor's audiences, but we never see them. Uh, and the prime ministers never talk about them. Indeed, that's the point. See Helen Mirren. Um, but the, 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 it's complicated, and without going into too much detail, the, the initial uh, work in terms of getting them to talk to us and think about the possibility was, was not mine. It was um, a, 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 a royal hack, a wonderful uh, guy called Robert Hardman, who written a book about the Queen that the palace approved of. He was part our consultant. He was part of the team get, getting the access. And they were made more confident by the fact that he would be there. Um, I and the production company, Oxford Film and TV, were obviously part of it, and, 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 and ITV, indeed. The, the, but the, 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 that's just the beginning. And so the process of, um, of, of carrying on, uh, yes, the, the nature of what you're doing and who you communicate with and how you do it and who your team are, uh, I mean, in the palace, it's just so ridiculous. There was a moment where I did find myself saying to the cameraman on an early shoot, uh, thank you for putting on what was clearly a wedding suit he hadn't worn for 10 years, because he did. but do you mind next time wearing better shoes? And uh, I mean, I was embarrassed, you know, he was an adult professional. And as we all know, most cameramen, you know, have to work hard physically and don't wear necessarily, you know, black shiny leather shoes but I was aware because people had told me that the Queen notices these things that that was n not ideal. So one, one has to be I mean in, in the, that's the degree of sensitivity that you have to show once you've got the access. Access is one only one part of it. But it's the beginning isn't it you have to build then on that access don't you yes. you have to uh, build those relationships you have to make sure you're their friend um, because the, the degree of that how successful that degree of friendship is depends absolutely on the quality of the film and the doors that you can unlock once you see access can be very limited quite quickly they can quickly go against you and close doors that you would like opened well I, I mean I want to ask you exactly about that because as you say as you both have said getting the access is is the first thing how do you square getting the access with the pressure t to deliver something which is really watchable while maintaining that relationship that you had when you got the access. And in, in other words, how, do you sh how are you sure that, that you, you don't do anything once you're inside, almost to put it brutally, bluntly, to upset them and to kind of shut the access down? Because that's, that's very important. I mean, getting in is one side of it. It's, it's identifying very quickly, isn't it, who your key characters are, building that relationship with them and not getting to know them as people and making sure that you don't... Um, I was saying earlier that I don't know if any of you saw Mad Men last night. There was an access meeting in Mad Men to one of America's biggest uh, car firms, which is the biggest piece of business Mad Men had. Don Draper spoke out of turn. They've nearly lost the business. You make sure your filmmaker isn't doing that sort of thing, talking out of turn. Uh, and it, it's, it's picking people without who, who've got self -efface, who are self-effacing. No egos, please. You know? yeah. But and, in and terms of, of your question, which is how do you make it transmittable as well as staying in, uh, is the question. Because their motivation in letting you in, whoever they are, whether it, what, uh, when we're talking mostly about institutions here, institutional actors, obviously within institutions there are people and therefore you have to constantly keep up those relationships. You know, the, the junior isn't going to just deliver the nuggets you need just because the chairman has told the staff to do so, to cooperate. But the, 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 the business of um, constantly having in one's mind the fact that this has got to punch through, it's got to be in some way revealing in a new way, hopefully, um, and therefore when the doors are being closed or people are clamming up, how do you push without being chucked out it is, I mean, there's no straight answer, but it's something that, I'm sure Paul would agree, but one is constantly aware of. Uh, you say, it, Paul, obviously it matters who the people are who you employ. You're in a business of, of employing people to do so. I'm, I'm more doing it than having a team. Because they all have, they all, the people, people in the institution, they have a broad perception of what they hope you will do. You also have a view about how far you want to go, but you have to be careful about how far you push that because they could suddenly 
slammed the door. Absolutely. So it's, it's all of that, um, but also, crucially, building that relationship, persuading whoever they are, whether it's the people who surround the Queen or whether it's the people running a, a, a prison or, or a police station or an A&E department, is persuading them that warts and all is good for them. Uh, because everywhere you go, whether it's the A&E department or whether it's the palace or whether it's the uh, strange ways, they're trying, to, they're trying to show you their best face. You're trying to show, you, show them, obviously, the honest face. And I, th I think what, what I do with my, my teams, I brief them that that friendship is so important because they're, gonna get, they're only going to show you what's best. What you've got to get is the warts and all. And persuading them that a, a whitewash, a party political broadcast is not good for them. I think there is an understanding. I've said to people in, or decision makers in institutions while it's happening, look, at the moment we're just getting the PR side. That will look like PR to a sophisticated audience now because viewers, of course, have changed too in the, over the period of time as more access happens. So if you don't let us show, I mean, obviously not your evil terrible, corrupt doings that you're trying to hide from us. I even sometimes sure. joke. But at least something that is, looks a bit as if, if your PR department it, were making it, they wouldn't have in. Then a, 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 a terrestrial, you know, one hopes prime time, large audience will feel it's, it's, it's all false. So one has to, a, a small anecdote of a complete failure that I had, but at least didn't get chucked out, but I was summoned uh, at, at the palace to a meeting. Uh, and it was as banal as it's conceivable to forget. The, the piper, every morning, I'm sure you know this, <laughs> Sir Trevor, uh, underneath the Queen's bedroom, started by Victoria, Queen Victoria, there is the Queen's piper. He pipes, bagpipes, which I don't particularly like the sound of, but apparently the Queen does. And every morning he goes up and down under her window, whichever palace she's in. We did it in Buckingham Palace Garden, beautiful, sort of misty day. And we had not set up beforehand, or rather had asked and actually been refused, um, the possibility of interviewing the bloody piper. And so I thought, I'll just take a risk. And he did his piping, and it was all mild. And I said to him, tell me about piping. How did it start? To just you know, give me the information so we don't have to have it in commentary. The press officer who was with us, and you'd ever film anything in a royal area without a press officer lingering, said, no, Michael, you can't interview him. I said, I just want him to, exp you know, he's a lovely, aren't you, you know, what's his name? Are you happy? He said, whatever press, you know, he was as a military type. Cut to, I decided to uh, calculatedly get to get slightly angry with the press officer. I said, this is ridiculous. You know, he's only, he's happy. All I want to do is ask him about what Queen Victoria set up. It's completely uncontroversial. And I calculatedly got to, to a level that was clearly more than just a discussion, thinking, I can't be bothered. I mean, yes. I, 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 and I, I want them to know that they can't just say no all the time. Half an hour later, I was summoned to the press secretary herself in this grand office, and the press office was there, and I was told it was outrageous that in the front of the piper I'd made this poor woman embarrassed and whatever. And I decided then, calculated to say, I sort of listened it out, I said, I, I, uh, I'm trying to remember this, it was something like, um, I absolutely um, apologize. I did the wrong thing. I shouldn't have said that in front of the piper. Because well, it was a decision. Uh, all, all, all I can say is, um, from my experience with these things, I wouldn't wait for the knighthood if I were you. But you raise a very interesting question, because you have to tread your way through this very, very carefully, while at the same time, um, not trying to annoy them, but you have to maintain your own trust, the own, your own integrity. You have to make sure that you keep editorial controls. And you have to try to be very firm on what occasionally may happen. They may kind of try to offer you a, what are called sort of side deals. If you do this bit, then we will let you do this if you let me. How, how, do, you deal, how do you deal with that? Because it's a, it's a, it's a constant I think during this filming in difficult access situations. Yeah, I think, sadly, it's one of those things now, particularly going back to what I was saying about 10 minutes ago, with the advent of, apart from Whitehall, large PR, British PR firms now being involved in this. They all want you to do a side deal. I know that Michael has, nor have I, we've, neither of us have ever done a, a side deal, but there are... Give me, an, give me an example of what a side deal might A side, deal, like. a side deal is, where, where, where I had it with a, a large, uh, uh, famous hotel in London two years ago, where you can, yes, you can make your series for ITV, BBC, but as long as you... Um, if there's anything, we want to see the programmes, if there's anything damaging to our brand, or any of our waiters, our butlers swearing, um, that, that would have to be cut out. And so 
we didn't, we didn't get them to make that program, but it's come up time and time again. Um, even white, there are some, there are some ministries in Whitehall which will try it on, but but you can easily bat the ball back against that. I, I haven't found that a problem, but it's where you've got where you're dealing with um, some household names with uh, in the PR industry, it makes it very difficult. What, what can we move on then? Uh, I mean, what does it take to get once you have got some broad agreement about the kind of access that you think you are going to have? Um, you mentioned the business about pr making a proposition to Michael Grade earlier, but what does it take to get a broadcaster to actually get interested in the fact that you have got this access? I mean, how do you, how do, you do that? What's that process like? How easy is that? How difficult is it? Um, in increasingly difficult because it's a saturated market now with many homes for, for the various forms of factual program making. I think the common, there are very few common denominators, the main one being hopefully you're offering them something new and unique, that even in the, the four prison series, each one has had a clear identity. You know, Aylesbury was very different, um, a new team, um, a different age group, 18 to 21, um, a different sort of more pernicious crime. Uh, so you're, you're hoping, even though it's the fourth prison series, you don't want it to look like the others, you want it to be you want it to be very different. I think that what I'm trying to do, and I think obviously most of my peer group are trying to do, is to offer broadcasters something very different, which becomes increasingly difficult because of, there are very few new things. Now, television, as we all know, is very circular. But when you went into a broadcaster and you say you've got access to the palace, they'd bite your hand off, wouldn't they? Uh, yeah, it depends what sort of access. That, that's a subject which you, you can be pretty confident that it, there's likely to be a bite. But, I mean, moving on from bloody royals, uh, the, 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 there are some institutions, I mean, it's interesting, we talk, the, the, you talk about the prisons that uh, Paul has done so well so often. Um, hospitals, you know, are endlessly on television in some quite remarkable series in the last few years, and they continue to go. It's, it, in a sense, it's not that, I, I would imagine, because uh, I've never pitched a, a hospital uh, access doc to a broadcaster, but the, the question would be not, uh, let's not do another hospital because it's been done so often, but what's the new angle? I mean, everybody knows that hospitals, all life passes through them, and therefore, whether it be a rig show or a particular a a angle uh, on something else, that it, it, I, I, I'm pretty sure that, that, that there are sorts of things, sorts of institutions that are perennially interesting. You probably didn't have to do this, but would you would you, for example, as quite routine, send them a taster tape and say, look, this is the kind of thing which I'm being given here, and, and, um, um, and there'll be mu you know, 55 minutes more of it if you, if you bite this idea? I haven't, uh, for an institution, done that. I, I think my instinct, Paul might, might have more experience with this, is that if, if there's not much need or point in, in um, doing more at the first stage than saying, would you be interested, We've had a conversation, an initial conversation with Institution X. They say they will listen to our request for access, but it depends who, what, whether. Should we pursue it? And then a broadcaster will say either no, couldn't, not interested at all in that, or uh, possibly, but tell us more. I suppose at that point, a taste tape. But do you do taste tapes for institutional access? Um, not for institutions, no. 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 Uh, can I move on then? I mean, we, 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 we're talking mainly about, about access. It, and, and you, Paul, you, you, talked, you, you talked about uh, um, some kinds of access in, in certain areas of territory, which you just mentioned and people talk about, like the prison films, for example. Um, are there, does it follow that there are certain types of access which have a timeless quality about them? So if you, you mention the word monarchy or prisons or hospital, that people automatically jump, they automatically buy? Um, there are a few things, and there are not many left now, but I, I think a unique situation, like um, that 14 Days in May, which was a unique film about, because the man I was filming on death row happened to be innocent, and everyone involved in his execution were telling me that. So it becomes a unique situation. It's not just another prison film. It's about a man dying. And I, I think there are, in one's you know, a typical career, there are very few of those sort of things that come up. So it transcended the sort of generality of a prison film, and there was one yeah. big, specific, and, I mean, endlessly fascinating story. Yeah. And it's, but on that occasion, it's, it's, uh, that was a BBC film, and, the, the, you know, the, the rigorous BBC balance training, and that's, uh, there comes a moment when 
is possibly the time not to be balanced and um, yeah. to stop being balanced and actually supporting the main the subject of your film because he's about to die. Yeah. Let's th th that's always fascinating. Let, let's 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 have a look at, at this <coughs> your film 14 days in May coming up. Now, I don't believe that really it's all sunk in yet. It couldn't have, because if it all sunk in, I'll probably be done running my head through his walls. You know what I'm saying? But I look at it like this. Ten days. Have I ever been this close to death before? I guess I get afraid of time. Yeah, every time I hear a dose squeak, I'm, up, I'm looking, you know, morning. The noise banging out there about the gas chamber myself. What they bang to do on me? I often look at it, gazing. You might say, thinking. But see, the thing about it, it's been there for the seven years that I've been there. There's nothing new to look at. There's nothing new to look at. Very, very, very chilling just looking at that. It's, um, it was an, an unusual, uh, it was an unusual um, situation to be in. One went to make a film about the morality of the death penalty, not about innocence. And um, as soon as I got there, I had two weeks to make the film only. Uh, that was the deal with the prison. And um, everyone, the prison governor, the, la the nice lady who diffed out the drugs on death row, the chaplain, uh, the prison psychiatrist, they all said, this is the man that didn't do it. And, so, you, so why aren't you stopping it? You know, it, it becomes. Uh, so you stop being balanced, don't you? And, and um, it's a great, great story it's, um, to tell. Um, Ma Michael, what about your 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 film? Entirely different in nature. Your film, The House. Um, I mean, it's rather difficult to define that as a kind of kind of access. But in a way, it's it's also easy because it's it's you're looking in at an institution, at a level which many people have not been able to do before. Yes, I mean, I think as a type of thing, you can say great British institutions, and obviously the Royal Opera House is, is one, and in, in this country more than other countries, it has connotations, and they were aware of it, possibly hence allowing us in the first place of elitism and over-subsidy by uh, the majority for the pleasures of a minority. So. Uh, but also my idea in, in doing that uh, series, it was a six-part series on BBC Two, uh, and it was interesting that the commission was from the documentaries department rather than the arts department, was not not to start... Six-part series? Six-part well, series. How do you do a deal about that? Uh, times might have changed. Anyway, those, in those days, they, it, it, was, it was fully financed by the BBC, no need for co-production money. So I find myself with the option of doing a whole lot of pla on Placido Domingo and not doing so, except one little question I put in, because I didn't need to make it work for an American audience, say. As it happens, it was taken up in America and, and did very well. But um, that's a, another story about how UK financing versus uh, international co-productions. But the, there's a clip that I would like to show here, but which is to do with the fact that uh, any institution is both specific and particular and peculiar, <laughs> in the case of the Royal Opera House Ferry, uh, and also universal, there are universal points to be made. And so I, was, I had a, a, a genuine journalistic agenda, which was partly to look at industrial relations in Britain those days, and we had a, you know, the stagehands and, and negotiations on employment contracts and all that sort of stuff, which is quite a long way from tutus and arias, although we had all those and them going wrong as well. So it was a good, that's why it made six parts, I think. There was a nice balance between the, the, the institutional banalities and the extraordinary business of a curtain going up every day at 7.30 and something apparently extraordinary happening. But one of the things I was conscious of was, and this is the days before the office, that um, anybody watching this, I, I, I wanted it to work for people who had never been or never thought about going to opera or ballet, and they might then be seduced into it, because I did, I did have an affection for those art forms. So, office politics. Uh, they, we all know about those, bosses who are infuriating bosses who manifest characteristics which um, the staff might snigger at. The, ironically, talking about access, the director of communications at the Royal Opera House, who had, of course, been part of the decision-making or the, part of the team involved in allowing us in and then supervising us, and very light touch, I'm glad to say, was, in my view, 
a very good character. I made him a character. And uh, we let's run the little clip. Of yes, the I think let's, let's have a look at the clip. You've never ever said to me, come up for, with a business plan about how advertising sales... I have sales a business plan, and what I have done... ...should be resourced and all the rest of it. It's just not true. And we're now two weeks away from the moving well, day. And the, and the move and is relevant. The move is completely academic. The yes, move, but I've, you this is a demonstration of how I have been feel that I've been treated by the Opera House over the past two, three months, four months, five months, six months. Well, but you, you're making a sort of, not a, a rod for your own back, but you're saying, I must sort of keep my pool of advertisers together with me. And then I must have, you know, the people that I am, you know, your core of, mm. of, 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 of sales <coughs> force. Hello. No, she's not. So, I'm... Um... It's, it's, um, it's, it's, it's really nice to see how the Opera House deals with its customers. Uh, uh -huh. there. That, I think that's, um, that's a great clip. Can I, can I come on to, to one point which I regard as highly contentious for all sorts of personal reasons? Is, is a presenter inserted into the idea of, um, of a film like this or like the prison film and what you do? Do you need a presenter? Is it ever a good idea? to have a, a presenter in some of these films. Uh, yeah. I, I have absolutely, <laughs> I, I ask this in a totally dispassionate way, of course. Michael, you, I'll, you I'll, go ahead, Michael. I will <laughs> carry this as if you were a, a provocative director of communications at an institution one's trying to get in. In many cases, a presenter is absolutely indispensable. Uh, Thank you. But, <laughs> but in, terms of, um, in terms of, uh, if we're talking about access to an institution, which obviously there are other sorts of access, and within institutions there are individuals, but it, it, that sort of thing, um, I would say it's rarely a good idea. I have worked and enjoy working with presenters, and you get a completely different uh, sense of access to people, especially if the presenter is well-known and well-liked, uh, whether with good reason or not, uh, and the... <laughs> Potential Probably not, the yes. potential contributors are excited by the presence of the presenter, and they will, in a sense, open doors, even legs. Uh, uh, <laughs> I go a bit too far, but you know what I mean. The, there's a sense of, well, uh, uh, interested in stars. And so where you have a... And I'm talking about starry presenters, and I, I've worked with a few. Uh, they can be infuriating, but they can, give an ex, they can give something very different, which you wouldn't get otherwise. But in terms of getting a portrait in an observational way of a place and its people and the conflicts within them, I'd say, on the whole, you get in the way. Uh, you, well, you had, cl you clearly, dealt with I mean, tele clearly, television is in, in, infuriating presenters. Well, in the past. We've, all, we've all met them, but but, <laughs> I, I, but I think television, you know, as we all know, it's, there's a mix has to be a mixed economy and um, sparing your blushes. People like yourselves and M Michael Paley and Stephen Fry, the national treasures. There's a, I think it's an important part of the landscape of television and giving people a mixed diet, isn't it really? From your gritty prison documentary or your, or your series about the Opera House to um, to have. They bring a different audience, you know, to uh, some difficult subjects sometimes. Well, we've dealt with presenters there quite quite quickly. I'll, I'd like to kind of end this end this round because I, w I want to throw it throw it out to to questioners. But I'd just like to just just for uh, to whet your appetite for questions. I'd like to play two clips, if I may. May I do that, Stuart? Um, um, the first one is, is is one of your films, Putin's Palace. That's Paul's. Uh, sorry, it's pa Paul's film, Putin's Palace. Can we can we just set that up and play that, and then we'll come to the audience. The job of Dmitry Peskov and his team at the press department is crucial to the presidency of Vladimir Putin. In a society where the press is much freer than it was, the image of the president has to be presented, both at home and abroad, much more carefully than it used to be under the Soviet regime. Although, like all spin doctors, Dmitry Peskov insists that he's just presenting the truth. Our job is to ensure that what our president does is uh, highlighted objectively. Mm. 
Western media are not so willing to be objective in, uh, uh, in focusing on Russia, on focusing on Russian president. He's being blamed for everything. Strange phenomenon of blaming the man who runs the country for everything. I mean, that's an uh, amazing concept. Shall I, shall I just say something about that? Please, a, the, the, quickly. I want to just quickly show that clip because it's an example of access doing, going wrong. It took me two years to get the access to the Kremlin. I was feeling really proud of myself. I was so wrong. We made that film. Richard Denton made it. We, they, were, they went back on everything. They, they chaperoned every, us everywhere. Our hotel rooms were, were gone through. Our notebooks were stolen. And we were lucky to get anything out of it. And we wished we hadn't got the access. I've heard about this film of yours, Michael, about the Cambridge College. And I just wanted to share with, with people well, here this, this, this college. I'll let you talk about it at the, at the, at the, at the end. Let of me it. introduce it very briefly, yeah. because it's, 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 it's not a dramatic piece of uh, footage. It, this was a series, uh, as the quality of the VHS transfer to DVD will show, m made in the mid-'80s, so uh, a long, long time ago, where things were different. But the, the point of this point, uh, thing is that you can get access to an institution, but then you have to persuade individuals. And this is a first-year engineering student sponsored by Rolls-Royce who's failed his first-year exams and is about to be thrown out. And getting him to agree to allow our camera in was prevented until 30 seconds before we entered the room. Fascinating. Let's have a look at the clip. I suppose what I want to try and assess is how much effort you've put into the course this year. Mm. Nobody's had any complaints about the work that you've put in, for instance. Yes. And there are two, well, there are lots of categories of students, but there are two in particular, those who fail because they don't work, mm. in which case you might say, well, yes, if they give up rowing or give up acting, yeah. they could go on mm. and by directing all their efforts to academic work will get through. Mm. As I see it, your case is rather different. It's not that you've slacked. You have put in the work, but you just haven't made the grade. Mm. And that, in a way, is a rather more serious case. Yeah. S serious case is you are not just good enough, um, which is uh, uh, you know, absolutely wonderful to be able to get that exchange between a tutor. And, and, and the students. So with that, may I now throw the floor open to questions to these two eminent gentlemen. There's, uh, there's somebody, I'll come to you, ma'am. Uh, somebody, uh, the, the gentleman at the back, uh, the, in the middle row there. Yes, right there. Thank you. Gentlemen, good afternoon. Um, we've heard a lot about um, once you've got access, but what about actually getting the access? Um, is it the press office, or is it having Michael call Michael Grid? Um, how, how do you actually begin the process of achieving access in the first place? Yes. I imagine everything is slightly different, but let, 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 let me get Paul to address that. Uh, um, uh, Trevor's answered it, really. It's every, everything is different. You, you make a judgment on what's the best approach to, um, to getting that access. With Whitehall departments, it's very f f which I do a lot of, it's very formal. Uh, and you make sure that, that um, you learn a lot about the person before you ring her or him. Um, uh, you see if you've got, if you've known anyone also in the organisation, you, you can make a, you can get a personal introduction. I've often done that. that. That sometimes works, but it's a very difficult question to answer. Everything is different. You know, some are very easy. Some, like the Kremlin, take two years, and you wish you hadn't got. <laughs> I, I repeat the same. It depends. Uh, it just off the back of that Cambridge clip, when 30 years ago when I was trying to get the access, if things were never easy. In that case, I was told, okay, we'll let you, but you've got to persuade all the members of the college. So there were me huge meetings of all the undergraduates, the graduates and the, and the fellows, and uh, being questioned in a public meeting, chucked out while they discussed, then brought back in, and so on. So it can be, it's always a relatively long drawn out process. So there are very few even places that are sort of autocracies with someone at the top who has power to make that decision usually wants it to be democratized in some way. Yes, that's a very good point because if I may just add, the fact now once upon a time you can go into a place and point a camera with a wide shot uh, and, and have everybody involved, you can't do that anymore. You almost have to get the permission of almost everybody who appears on that and that is now, I think, a big, big difference which, which we all have to, have, have to go through. Let's, let's have another question. Um, yes, ma'am, you're right here. Uh, 
it's, it's really keeping on a similar vein. You mentioned that it took you two years to get access to the Kremlin and a year to get access to the prison. Can you just talk us through that process? So you initially make a call, they say no. I mean, do you just keep mithering them to death? or um, Yes. Well, what's happening in those yeah. two years? Uh, even 14 days in May, they, I wrote to, at that time, 37 of the, of the 52 states uh, had the death penalty. Every one of them said no, including the place... I went to, I didn't, don't like, no, and they said, you can, you can come and make a film, not about the death row, but you can come and make a film about conjugal visits. I thought that was rather strange. They were very proud of their conjugal visits in, in Mississippi. Um, and so I went... You, did, you filmed some of these? Uh, no, no, no. no. <laughs> but luckily I bonded with the, the governor of the prison. And so that, that's very different. Again, it's personal relationships. With the Putin film, Peskov, who remains very powerful, uh, is... He's still uh, uh, Putin's right-hand man, that man Peskov you saw in the clip. I made sure I bonded with him. I went to see him three times uh, in two years. And um, so it was very good of the BBC to bankroll that. It might not happen now. Our budgets are much tighter. But um, so everything, everything's slightly different. I, I think in answer to that, your question and the gentleman, the first question, uh, I was just thinking one of the things that changed dramatically in the last 18 months post Levinson, one of the things that did often work in underpaid press officers in Whitehall departments. They really did like a good lunch because they couldn't do it any other way. And th that actually did open doors at the beginning. Not anymore. At Levinson, they're all, they can't, you can't buy them lunch anymore. In fact, you get points if you take them to Pret. <laughs> <laughs> you want a quick word on that? No, uh, okay. And, and, no, okay. The, the question here. Um, s sorry, right at the front here. Hi Thank there. You. Um, with regard to access agreements, um, do you do you find there's any? You, could you reflect on any issue, particular issues in terms of them ask, uh, institutions asking for uh, to check for fact, fact, factual accuracy, but more so even editorial interference? Um, have you had any particular issues with that? In uh, other words, once you've got the access, do you find that they yeah, in the they still try and put some yeah. Well, uh, Paul will, has mentioned and can talk more, no doubt, about the... Uh, I've never actually had someone asking for a, a side deal. Although, the, the, I mean, my line, and it's a very useful line to just hold, is the broadcaster retains editorial control. And, and if they can't agree to that, there's not much point in going forward. When they worry about that, one then says, of course, given this extraordinary access, you're trusting us, we must trust you, a, factual accuracy. We will show you the programs beforehand if we've got something very wrong. Uh, in the case of the House all those years ago, uh, it, was e it was also a discussion that if the transmission of, the, of a program might have fundamentally harmed the Opera House's relationship with a third party, I mean, they were thinking of someone saying, that fucking Pat Pavarotti can't sing, and they're just about to try and get him to come back. That sort of thing. We said we would take very seriously their representations. Now, we didn't make any promises, but we said, look, if, if, if that thing is going to clearly, completely bugger up your relationship with one of your main stars, we will try and be understanding. In the case of the, uh, the palace, the agreement was similar, factual accuracy, but also security. And so it's a very interesting thing having a policeman watching your film with a view to whether you're giving away how a terrorist can shoot the Queen. But, yes. uh, which, but is, which is a very reasonable... Completely reasonable. A, a, a very reasonable proposition. But don't also forget that there's the, there's the obvious point too, which is that, as, 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 as Paul said, you, you went in to that prison visit for, for on the understanding of one thing, but you got something which was much more arresting. So it could also... I mean, let's not be too gloomy about it. It could also work in your favour. Another question, please. Any, any other... Another question. Yes, uh, uh, so right here in the middle row. Yeah, um, Ma microphone is coming to you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so access means you've got the bosses to say yes, but then you have to turn up and you can face sometimes a kind of surly workforce who don't want to be filmed. I just wondered if that had happened and, and how you... M many times. All the t in fact, all the time, and you have to respect that. In the prison films, quite a lot of people... Um, all four of them, uh, uh, one of the filmmakers is here in the front row who made Ellsbury, Lee Phillips, um, you have to absolutely respect the fact that they're locked up. Uh, that the, that's their punishment. You, do, you can't abuse them as people. And so uh, quite a significant uh, number of people, particularly at the beginning, don't want to be filmed. And then, of course, you bed into an institution, and then they get their egos kick in, and they think, well, why, I, I might want to be in this. And then, later on... Why aren't, why aren't you filming me? The people that said... And then they get really upset. Why wasn't I in the film? They were on the cutting room floor. So usually it goes full circle from 
piss off to I want to be in it. You know. So that that is the good part. You can end up with something better. Indeed, and and th that that ancient Cambridge thing was a you know a, a, an intelligent guy who thought his his life was about to be ruined, saying no, 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 and I just. I, it was so important to me to illustrate that it, things go wrong. I, I can't remember what I did, but I took him to, for a long walk by the side of the river and sat him down and talked about his life and his future and how I understood it deeply. But I, well, his, you know, his lack of a future. Whatever. Future. So you just you get the bit between your teeth. But eventually, I mean, in that case, I, I got it, hence that, that little clip. But, but in obviously other cases, you don't. The, sometimes it's even more complicated. So the boss has said yes. The instruction is these people are good, be what you, but no boss will ever say you have to be interviewed or have to agree to be filmed. And I remember once uh, you have to be, I was about to use the word duplicitous, I think just short of duplicitous, but you sometimes have to, and I can remember again in the house, there was you know, two senior people were going to have a meeting about something I, which was central to a story neither of them knew I was following. And I had to not say to either that the other had said yes, because if I had, then they would have known that the other had told me this meeting was happening. It was a secret meeting. I got one to, over a period of time, reveal to me in confidence the meeting was happening. I said, oh, how fascinating, could we film? He said, well, yes, but only if Bloggs says yes, and, and I, you, know, you can't ask him. Because... So I went to Bloggs and then said, over a period of time, got him to reveal that he was meeting Jones, oh, can we film, and so on. So you, 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 you can go wrong without realizing it by saying to Bloggs, can we film your meeting with Jones, who will then say, how the fuck do you know we're having a meeting? Yes. This is outrageous. I didn't give permission for this. So it's, it can be very complicated. Um, I think, though, the point is, I mean, just, again, to, to not, 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 not to make, to put too, too, too gloomy a, a, a picture on it, the, the fact is that you can sometimes get something much, much better than you thought in the, in, in the first place. I think Indeed. that was illustrated. I think the, the, the other point to make, too, is that the fact that somebody is locked up in the prison for having killed half his village or something, does not give us the automatic right to put them on a camera. You have to respect people's oh, people's rights. I think I think that's desperately right. important. Well, some another question. Um, let's take one right at the back there. There's a raised hand. Yes, y yes, sir. Um, uh, okay. Oh, sorry. Went, went further than I thought. <laughs> Further back Hello. than I thought. I'll um, come to you, hopefully. Yes, please. What about the aftercare? Because obviously when you're filming, you make friends with people, they become important to you, and you become very important to them. It's a special time often when people are filming, and they often enjoy it. And then two years later, three years later, once the programme's gone out and that's all died down, do you maintain friendships? You know, from the, the guy in Cambridge who you spent a lot of time talking to, do you still know him? How do you cope with that afterwards? It's a, it's a very good question, aftercare, and it's something... Um, I, I st on my first directing break, I uh, was on the first year of the community program year, an open door, making for programs with people. I suppose that's where I think I learnt my craft. Anyway, the man you saw in prison who was gassed in the gas chamber, that innocent man, I still talk to his family. Uh, I went to visit them in Mississippi 18 months ago, you know, and um, so, I mean, that's an extreme example because it was a very important part of my life, really. But um, something we do in my company, we take aftercare really seriously, and it's something I talk to all the filmmakers about. Where it's necessary, of course, there are some people you make films about who don't want to see you again. Uh, you, uh, and you, yes, do you, do you still no, exchange notes with, with Her Majesty? <laughs> <laughs> That's a different one, which I obviously will be uh, executed if I tell you about. But um, uh, I jest, uh, no contact at all, I'm sorry to say. Uh, the, the, Cambridge uh, engineering student who allowed us to film his failure, actually the story developed fascinatingly and between the filming and the editing and transmission there was a big enough time to tell the tale that he appealed, he, he was uh, going, he, he was an, again, eventually allowed back in despite the fact that he was deemed to be too thick according to <coughs> that tutor. Uh, he chose to go to another university instead he has since become extremely successful. It's a fascinating story. Uh, I haven't spoken to him for some years, but I, that last bit I know, he's now a multimillionaire. So um, he, he's all right. But I have a, a, a tale which, uh, Very quickly, against, against, against myself question. in foreign filming, that's just a small point. I once was filming in, in uh, Cyprus, Turkish Cyprus, a little Greek community still in Turkish Cyprus, 
a, a, a woman who'd lived there all her life agreed to be filmed, was scared about what the Turkish authorities would say, a Greek in uh, Turkey against the Turkish occupation. I wrote to her after the film went out, and I, uh, rather, I wrote to the authority. I, I, did, I did stuff to try and protect her from what might have happened, and I never heard back from her, and I don't know, and I feel a residual guilt 20 years later. I don't think anything dramatic would have happened to her, but there are some times where aftercare is difficult if it's in foreign parts. It can be, yes, indeed. Now, there was, there was, a, there, there was a gentleman, uh, yes, uh, um, you, you passed him again. That's right, thank you. Right there, that's it. I, I'm so sorry. Uh, Hi, yes, um, uh, some institutions, uh, I'm thinking particularly the Met Police at the moment, have started to charge for access. How do you think that affects the filmmaker's relationship? So, sorry, they, they charge for access? Charge for access, yes. Right. Uh, uh, very, very quickly. Even there, um, part of the, those skills that you hire people for to be schmoozers, uh, I've just done something with uh, the Met. Uh, I, sh I got the producer to save the budget money by schmoozing, taking the guy out, post Levinson for dinner. There was no charge. You didn't, you didn't pay? No. Did, have you ever paid? Uh, the palace got money not for the Queen's gin, but for their charity. Perfectly ah. good arrangement. That's, that's very good. And actually quite useful. I mean, I felt I never raised it, but at the point where things might have gone worse with the press secretary, I just sort of said, you know, you've got our money. Yes. So you, 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 you pay. Uh, in, in, in the end, one probably always pays in some way. Uh, There's a question here. I'd like to take another question. Just no, right in front here. So thank you. Uh, hello. Um, well, you mentioned about the whole idea of PR, Michael. And I'm wondering, is the kind of warts, for all, uh, warts and all betrayal, is that going to get more popular with brands, do you think, in the future? Or do you think they're still going to want to have a clean image in the future? Well, picking up from what Trevor says, I, I think it's not all gloom and doom. And I think there is the very sophistication that there is now includes the understanding that if it comes across as smooth PR, it might not ring as true to an audience. I mean, that's what I say to people, and they might or might not believe it, but I think to some extent they do. So there's an understanding that a warts and all portrait will possibly do better PR than a saccharine one. Let's take one final question. I have time to get a quick final question. Um, uh, there's this lady here. You, you, uh, did you ask a question before? No. No, you didn't. <laughs> In which case, you have a chance now. I have a chance. <laughs> um, my question is to either of you. Um, is there any institution that you've never been able to get access to where you've been unsuccessful? This guy has gone to the height of the monarchy and he's gone to the depths of death row. They've obviously got a span of... Uh, the, anyone that you want to do and you haven't... No, the, the ones... The answer to the question, I, I really rather pass. The ones that I haven't, I'm talking to at the moment. So, so, so we, don't, we don't want to know. We, we, we must try and get that out of him later. Michael? Um... There have been programs about the Vatican, but never um, into the bedroom of the Pope. That would be a good one. Yes. I can't think what he's thinking about the bedroom <laughs> of the Pope. These men are beyond such things. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. And may I ask you please to give a very warm uh, reception to our two distinguished guests.